Welcome back to the BJJ Fanatics podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ford. My guest today is one of the top super featherweight competitors of all time. He's a five-time world jiu-jitsu champion, a world pro cup champion, a Pan Ams champion. He's also a Brazilian national champion and a Polaris super fight winner. He was also a former professional MMA fighter, and he now runs his very own academy out of uh, Tampa, Florida, and he also runs one of the most respected jiu-jitsu affiliations in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be joined today for the second time in my podcasting career by Professor Hobson Mora. How are you today, Hobson? I'm doing great, Ryan. It's always good to talk to you, man. I appreciate that. It's been many years, man. I think it's been since uh, the last time I interviewed you was 2016. So obviously a lot has been going on since then. So catch us up, man. What have have you been up to since 2016? Ah, man, you know, I've been like live the dream, you know, and uh, like do what I love to do every day. Uh, you know, training, teaching, travel the world, like teaching jujitsu, like you know, share, like sharing the, the 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 this gift you have, you know, and uh, it's pretty much that, you know. That's really incredible. That's awesome. I'm happy to hear that everything's going well. I'm happy you're healthy. I'm happy you're still teaching actively. And uh, yeah, you know, Hobson, I, I figured today, you know, you're without question one of the most technical jiu-jitsu fighters of all time. And for over two decades, you've displayed an incredibly efficient and sharp game that transcends all weight classes. And for that reason, I thought the topic of today uh, that would be good for you would be the topic of harnessing the science of jiu-jitsu. Um, now, Hobson, your game is very well-rounded. You've always displayed great passing and great guard work as well, almost equally. Uh, so, so I'm going to segment this a little bit. L- let's start with guard play. As a smaller practitioner, what do you think are some of the most important elements of being effective off of your back? Uh, you know, I, I, I think like martial arts for me, like special jiu-jitsu, like, like you know, what we do, um, it's got to be all about the, the, the understand of the technical principle, right? And uh, it's very hard for you to be on uh, martial arts no thing, you know, if you don't develop the technical skills, if you try to go like, you know, straight to the strength, it's 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 very hard to 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 win the, the thing, you know, especially the guy a metro strong and heavy than you are, and uh, so then you develop your game, your battle top, whatever. So me, uh, for many 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 years, and I was a battle guy. I was always play on my back, always feel very comfortable. My God. And uh, I remember in um, 2007, when I came back to the competition after I uh, took a few years break, everybody was like double guard the pool, like really fighting to be uh, playing from the bottle, you know. And then I put on my mind, you know what, I'm going to play for the top because it was everybody kind of expected me to kind of follow the same direction. And I kind of went to the other direction and play top game, uh, spend a lot of time in, like, uh, understand, like, the balance. And I always tell my guys over here, like, before you look for the pass, you want to make sure your balance is right there. It's not, it's most important the pass is secure to the balance, secure to the base. When you feel like your feet is glue on the floor, you feel like no matter how heavy you are, but you feel like twice heavy than you actually are, it's much easier for you to do put the pass right after, you know? And uh, that's what I look for, you know? That's really incredible, Hobbs. You know, there's something something I always appreciated about your games, particularly with your guard, uh, was was your ability to always generate kazushi. Uh, for the listeners not familiar with what that is, kazushi is a term from judo. It's the principle of off balancing your opponent. And Hobson, that was something that you, I noticed. Anytime you're using guard, your your opponents never looked comfortable. Like they always looked like they were trying to catch their balance back. Uh, and it's it's kind of interesting because when it comes to to really all aspects of jujitsu, Hobson, students often feel that specific techniques uh, are needed to resolve the problems they're having with their game. Like if you're having problems using guard, for example, it may be natural to think, well, the solution to make my guard better is I need more sweeps or I need to improve a submission attack. But sometimes we overlook some of the deeper principles like Kazushi that we may be lacking. So during your development, was Kazushi something you intentionally focused on or is it something that you found yourself naturally doing? Uh, I think it was more natural, like, you know, go to that path. Um, Again, like, you know, back in the years, we're talking about, like, when I start training, like, like, end of, like, beginning of 90s, end of 80s, and I was a young kid, very skinny, very, like, you know, uh, again, like, it just, I always kind of find my way there, how I gotta, and then how I'm gonna be able to survive, you know, and, uh, and then, and then, 
and I was able to kind of like create like technical skills to make to keep me on the mat, you know, to kind of know more about win on the train is more about survival, you know, and um, and that's how kind of went natural to that path, like to feel comfortable on the bottom, feel comfortable on the top. But I always tell my guys here, you know, in Tampa, I said, guys, it's very hard for you to be great in the every spot, but at least be able to survive in every situation you are. So I'm not expecting you to be the great bottom guy, the great top guy, the great finish. At least you know yourself around there. If you have to be on the top, you're good. If you have to be on the bottom, you're good. So it, the last thing you want to be creating on your game is kind of like, hey, this guy, he's really good, but he's really good on the half guard. But if you kill his half guard, you know, you don't have too much more, you know what I'm saying, information to keep going. And uh, I understand that the competition today is kind of push you to create that, that strategic game, you know, based on the rules. And it kind of like uh, you for, kind of forget about like okay how can I grow how can I keep improve my game not only based on that competition rules who develop like very like you know strategic for like you win that specific competition it kind of like you get the fights from like nineties and two thousand compared to fights now the fights back there was way too way more dynamic because the rules was based to make you fight. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I think that that, that that was helping me a lot, like, you know, to kind of, like, create that, that technical skills. View, view, call. Like I said, like, you know, my top game did came in, like, until, like, 2007. And I was all battle. I, you know, I was getting myself on the top, feel okay, but it was not my thing, you know, and then uh, when I change my mind, say, hey, I don't want to be just as a battle guy. That's when I like things start clicking better, you know what I'm saying? It's interesting to hear you say that, that you didn't really start focusing heavily on your top game and on your passing until 2007, because anyone that watches you perform uh, can see that that could easily be your A game. You, you, you do that so well. Um, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the idea of balancing uh, top and bottom game, because like you said, you don't want to be overly committed to one side of that. And I know that it's one thing that happens to a lot of students is as they develop their guard or as they develop their passing game, sometimes it creates a deficit uh, on the other side. Sometimes as your guard gets better, your passing gets worse, and your passing gets better, your guard gets worse. What do you think is the best way to lay out a, a curriculum or lay out your own training to avoid having uh, one side being uh, greater than, or worse than the other? Do you know what I think it was kind of helped me uh, to create like a, a solid like top game? Like I said, in 2007, my whole game was play on my back, right? And I knew exactly which position you need to put on me to make me feel uncomfortable from the battle. I knew exactly what you have to do, right? So when I change, start playing my top game, I say, look, if I feel uncomfortable when somebody puts me on certain, certain position, that's exactly where I'm gonna put people on. Because if I feel uncomfortable, people gonna feel uncomfortable too, because I've been spending like, lifetime on my back and I know if they get me there, I'll have like a hard time. So that's exactly the direction I'm gonna go. So that's how I start building my top game. And then after I felt better, after I felt like good balance, and as I increase like different kind of pass, like, you know, more dynamic pass, I really like it, control it and explode to like left to right and always force the guy switch direction, you know? And uh, that little trick, I remember like uh, back in the years, we have this, this thing like, every time the top guy, he slides like one inch on his tiptoes, he need to get swept. You need to sweep this guy. So that's exactly the mindset I have. Let's say, I cannot move on my tiptoes unless I'm gonna make some move into pass. You know what I'm saying? So there was all this like knowledge I had it was help me to feel comfortable with my top game and just keep it like build more and more from there, you know? 
That's ins- that's really awesome. That's really cool. So, so to switch back to uh, to to the bottom players uh, for for the people that are uh, focusing more on guard right now. Besides off balancing your opponent or using Kazushi, as we said, what do you feel are some other really important things to develop an effective guard that works on anyone, whether they're the same size as you or bigger? Well, it, it, again, like, I I'm you know I'm very uh, picky, right? Like on like. Like when you learn something, right? And uh, as a technique, as a drilling, as a uh, detail, whatever, it is j- your job to try that position because you all have different size body. The way I move is not gonna be the same way you're gonna move. It's not gonna be the same the same way. Bushesh is gonna move it because you all have different size body, right? So we have to create that specific detail that's gonna work for all game for all size matter body. I tell my guys all the time. When I teach you something, I want to see you try that position. A hundred times, two hundred times, a thousand times. I don't care how long it's going to take until you feel comfortable on certain such situation. What happened today, and uh, because, you know, we have so many great information there, but people, they look at information. They don't really sink the information to there and they make it their work, you know, because everything goes so fast and you pass through, oh, I, I saw this technique, oh, I saw this technique. But like seeing the technique and do the technique is completely different situation, you know. And uh, I tell my guys all the time about that, like, you have to learn how to be comfortable going through the uncomfortable situation. I was back in Brazil like a couple months ago, right? And I was teaching a seminar in Brazil. And uh, I was describe my game for the people there. So I've been doing that. I got my black belt 1996, right? Today, as a 44 years old, training for like, I don't know, 34 years, my game I divided in three pieces. Patient, comfortable, and uncomfortable. Why patient? Because I don't care how many times I'm gonna make you tap. My goal is like, if I can make you tap once in 30 minutes of training, but I don't have to expose myself that much, I don't have to really gas out and fight for that position, just let that position happen natural, and I feel comfortable to play, It's that is my goal right now. But to go there, I have to pass to the uncomfortable putting myself in the position of where I wanna be, learn how to feel comfortable there, and then grow from, from that, that pieces, you know? That's how I describe my game you now, you know what I'm saying? That's excellent. I really like that a lot. Yeah, I, I can definitely relate with what you're saying too. Like, there's, I think, especially nowadays with with the amount of information that's available to any student at any time, it can be a little overwhelming to to say, okay, yeah, I've, I've, I'm seeing hundreds of techniques every day as I'm scrolling through Instagram or on YouTube or whatever. But how do I how do I really absorb them? How do I really make them part of my game? So l- let's focus on that, if you don't mind. W- what do you typically recommend yeah. people do? Like when they see something, a, an area of their game that needs to be patched, what do you think is the best way to go about? It. Do you think that drilling something continuously, uh, positional training, what, what are your favorite ways to really like uh, in, um, ingrain that in their mind? Well, I, you know, I, I have a son, right? My son is 20, 26 years old. He's a black belt. He was black belt two, two, two years ago, I guess. Nice. And uh, I was telling my son when I was purple belt, again, I did have the back there was like, if you survive the match, you, you're good. You know, it was really hard. It was not much technique to be learning. It was not drilling. It was just like, try to kill each other as hard as you could. That was the whole game, right? And then I was telling myself, that when I was purple belt, on Monday, I would put on my mind, this week is gonna be my omoplata week. No matter where I'm gonna go, I'm gonna pull the omoplata from left and right, bottle, top, no, I don't care. So then I was kind of dragging me without knowing, drilling the position as I go to the sparring, right? And then week two, I say, okay, this week is my back take. I got to kill people in the back take. That's how I was breaking my training back then when I was a purple belt. And that works great for me. Great, right? And uh, at the same time, I was building more technique because I was, you know, putting myself a lot on, on certain, certain position. 
and uh, I was able to see why I'm losing the omoplata all, all the time, why I'm not able to go to omoplata as often as I should. You know, I'm saying all these questions was coming to my mind. It was helping me to become a battle, you know. That's and uh, like, 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 like you just had now. Like, I, I think all the information we have today is amazing. I'm so glad to be able to live and see all this information we have. Eyes, you know, uh, uh, DVDs, uh, uh, everything. It's amazing. I think we should take advantage of that, but we need to take the time to try the position. I just gonna just very quick I'm gonna break it down for you how I do here at the Army and HQ, right? So the first class we have in the school is Monday at noon. That's our first class in the week. So Monday at noon I pick the top of the week if you're gonna work on butterfly guard. So Monday noon I teach a butterfly position. Monday night I teach the same position. Tuesday we teach the same position and add something else. Wednesday, we teach the same position and add something else. On Saturday, we do the review of the week. That thing, I'm thinking that on your mind. At the same time, I'm giving you the opportunity to, to do the position and do the sparring. Because every day, I'm like, hey, butterfly, butterfly, remember the drill on Monday? Okay, let's do the drill on Monday. But if the guy go here, go here. So Tuesday, remember they do, they do like on Tuesday, now go, go here, go here, go there. I try to go for every aspect I can to kind of give you like, hey, it's right here. But at the end of the day, you are the one who has to really like make that happen. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if that makes sense or not, you know? No, it absolutely does. Yeah, well, I, I love this topic you're talking about, and that is just the overall idea of having a direction, having a developmental direction when you approach your training. And that's something, it's funny you said that you started doing that around Purple Belt, because that's about the time I started doing that too. I, I remember before getting my Purple Belt, I would just show up and my objective was to just tap as many people as I can and not get tapped as much as I, you know, as, as, prevent taps as much as possible. And, you know, that's fine and everything, but when I started really being mindful about having an objective, saying, okay, this week I'm doing this, or this month, or these two months, I'm going to focus on this, that's when I noticed things really started taking off for me. So I, I love that you're highlighting this. I, I think that having a developmental focus to approach your training is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And as, so, so once you were a purple belt, had, did, did you started doing that. Is that something you still do today as, as a black belt? You're, you're a, a, a fifth degree black belt right now, Hobson, or, or six? Six, 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 six degree. Six degree. Belt. Congratulations. So, 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 old, no, 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 you're getting better. You're getting better. <laughs> so, so with that said, as a six degree black belt, is that something you still do? Do you still approach your training sessions every week or every month with a new, with a particular objective? I do, I do. Let's say I'm, I'm very creative. Like I'm very creative. That's why I love the sport, and I push my guys to be the same, the same line. I say, I tell my guys, hey guys, if I teach your position, you see something else from there. Okay, don't be scared. Say like, hey, you know, this. I want. I really want to explore you to push you to see the things I may not be able to see yet. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm always creative. So when I'm creating something, I'm drilling, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. You know, and uh, when I kind of a, a little selfish here, like if I, if something comes to my mind, I I gotta try to do the class. On my spine, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try. So when I figure out, they go, hey guys, let me share this, but they share with everybody else. You know, that's oh, that's why you try to expose it the whole week, you know. I say, yeah, I was trying to make sure if they're going to fit good on my game. You know, again, like, jiu-jitsu is like, like, the way I see jiu-jitsu, I see jiu-jitsu outside the box. I say, okay, how can we grow? And again, like, thinking about, like, like say, me, 44 years old, I started training jiu-jitsu when I was 10 years old. I never did anything else on the life besides jiu-jitsu, right? Jiu-jitsu was my start as a... As a as an activity, became a sport, became a competition, fun thing, became my job, it became my life. So everything I did my whole life for 34 years, 34 years of my life was jiu-jitsu. So I don't see jiu-jitsu as kind of like a small thing. I see jiu-jitsu, okay, how can you keep it grow? How can you keep We have more room to keep it grow. We have more room to grow. You know, we see today, we see some techniques today, and I ask myself, Hobbs, why did you see this technique like back there? You know what I'm saying? And 
I kind of blame on myself sometimes, you know, but like, it's all like, it's gonna come with the time, you know, and uh, that's why I think like, yeah, we, when you step in the match, I tell my guys all the time, if I do ask you, Ryan, like, hey, how many techniques you know, number-wise, right? You, it's hard for you to give me some number. Yeah. Right? But if I ask you, Ryan, how much of your jiu-jitsu you do use every time you go training? So that question you got to ask yourself every time you step on the mat, do I use every technique I know? Use all the drill. I know that doesn't mean every drill is going to work. Yeah. Right? So, but at least you know why it's not work. At least you know, okay, what I have to make it better for that position work. And sometimes we, we kind of, I hear, I see people say that all the time because I've been teaching a lot of seminars and some people say like, oh, that position is not, I'm not flex for that position. I'm not fast enough for the position. Or I'm not beautiful enough for the position, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's, if that position is there, if you do put your time to make that position work, I guarantee you that position is going to be part of your game, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. But, but you've got the time, you know? Absolutely. Well, yeah, I, I love what you're saying here, and that is the idea. And this is so true. I mean, everyone everyone that's listening that trains experiences this. There's so many things in jiu-jitsu to focus on. There's so many variables that exist. There's so many positions. There's so many options. And it's constantly evolving. Like, as, as, as one thing becomes popular, people start discovering uh, solutions. And now you have to f work around the solutions. So it's hard It's hard to absorb every single aspect of jiu-jitsu. And, you, and you're right. At the end of the day, if you analyze your game it becomes a pretty refined list of, of just a short, it's usually a pretty short list of things that you actively use regularly in training. So, uh, so yeah, I love that you pointed that out because it's, it's something that a lot of people, everyone yeah. wants, everyone wants to be the Jedi that has all the knowledge, but man, it's, it's hard and it takes a long time. It's hard. You know, I was like, uh, like I was talking to one of my guy here, one of my black belt, tough kid, like, you know, I was training with him on uh, uh, Friday, last Friday. And then, and he would say like, look, I, he told me like, I have the feeling every time I'm going for some, some technique, you already read me, you already, you know, you already know what I'm going to do. And I told him like, I can feel the way you move, where you're going to go. But then he asked me how I built that. So 2013, I was in Japan and I was there for a super fight at the Hickson Grace Cup. I have the honor to be at the seminar uh, with the Hickson Gracie at the Axe Axe uh, School from my good friend Taka, and uh, and I remember Hickson uh, was talking to me and he told me like one thing like changing my whole mind. He said, "Look, the problem we have with the generation today, everybody wanna fight to cheat, but nobody wanna feel it to cheat." Mm. And I was. Mm. So you know, sometimes, like the way you see the guy, how he's moving, you can kind of imagine where he's gonna go. So then, when he goes there, you already there waiting for him for some with something, you know. And uh, that help you big time. That help that changed my whole mind about jujitsu. It helped me to like feel more comfortable. Help me to to to. To, to try new technique and help me to figure out, like I said, like, you can see, like, you know, like, how the guy make the grip, his feet work, how he's put the pressure, and now the way he look to you, you can see where he's going to go, you know, and uh, it's easy to build that. No, it's not easy, you know, but it can be done. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, you can you can oftentimes feel someone's intention. And then if you can't feel their intention necessarily, you can at the very least feel their body movement, their positioning, their weight exactly. distribution. And that's actually a perfect topic because it brings us right back to the overarching topic of today, which is using the science of jujitsu. So so let, let's let's dive on that a little bit more if you don't mind. When when you're when you're feeling someone's jujitsu, as Hickson said, what are you feeling? Are, are are you paying most attention to their posture? Are you paying most attention to their weight distribution? How how are you able to recognize what you think they might do next yeah I'm more like about the movement right mm -hmm. I feel like I want to see how he's moving it's like a seminar a lot of seminars I go people asking me hops what are you gonna be teaching until I step in the mat and see how people move I don't know what I'm gonna teach mm -hmm. because I made plans plenty something on my mind yeah I'm gonna work on this position I get there they don't move properly to that direction mm -hmm. the seminar is not gonna be good 
right? So there, I always like to go there, get a quick, specific warm up. Then from there, I'm mean, looking, I'm mean, looking for the whole room, I'm mean, looking everybody's movement. Do I can see, okay, this guy, now I see how they move, okay. If I get like few guys moving the same direction, that means I can go to that direction, right? So I feel that's how I do on the train. Like more they, when they start moving, I can feel, I mean, more about the, the movement, right? And uh, I'm, a, like I said, I'm a big fan, I'm a big love of body movement. I do believe if you do understand your body movement, you can build anything on the top. You can lift it up your full house if you understand your body movement, if you have the right leverage to do that. That's all coming up what you're talking about now. And uh, what's a lot of people they think, they think Jiu Jitsu is about a fight. Jiu Jitsu has nothing to do with the fight, nothing to do with the fight at all. Because you know, I knew and understood very quickly my body movement. I knew how far I could go, and I knew how the guy moving, what I have to do to kind of stop here or kind of like go for certain position A, B, C, D, whatever, it's depending on how it's going to be moving. And uh, that's how I always look for, you know? Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. I appreciate you explaining that. I, I know that's not an easy concept to explain verbally. It's one of those things like when Hick, hard, like yeah. when like when Hickson talks about the concept of invisible jujitsu or hidden jujitsu, um, it's it, it's hard to describe that without feeling it. He has to put hands on you and kind of dis, d demonstrate with you. Okay, you feel my pressure this way. You feel my movement this way. You feel my intentions are dragging you this way or going towards this motion or this grip. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you verbally explaining this because I know that is difficult to explain. Um, um, so something that's a little more easier to explain, I think, Hobson, uh, for, for people out there listening, anyone that studies your game, I think, would be very interested in understanding how you've used so successfully your jiu-jitsu as, as a super light heavyweight against bigger people, like in absolute divisions and even people just a few uh, categories ahead of you. What variations of guard do you feel are most effective for uh, against much heavier opponents? Like if you're a smaller person, you're facing someone who's much heavier than you. What variation of guard do you think is a really good place to start? for most people? Well, uh, I always tell my guys, like, look, there's nothing wrong on jiu-jitsu. It's, it's the right position, the position is going to work for you. I tell my guys, some guys, I tell them, hey, let's go for the spider, get a deep lasso, and the guys, oh, my foot's not going to have, how you feel, shadow lasso, oh, I feel good, good, like, that's the exact way you're going to go. Explore, like, you know, the position you feel comfortable to be, and, uh, and uh, like I said, I like I always always uh, uh, play with the big guys on my back, kind of sideways, and uh, every time they are moving forward, they always kind of slide myself out, and they kind of they, they I'm mean, here, they move over here, I'm slide myself over here. Yes. Then the back was kind of always exposed to myself, you know, and uh, but honestly, like it's it's very hard for me to say like. A specific guard game, I think the best one is gonna be the one you feel comfortable and see like, hey, I feel this position comfortable. I feel I feel I can do pretty well against like uh, big guys, small guys, whatever. And I think that the one you definitely should be put more time and explore more, you know. That's excellent. Yeah, I love that concept you just mentioned about being mobile, like the idea of not being, not hugging one spot on the mat. That's something. That's something I learned uh, around the time I was like a high blue belt. I, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was constantly defending one spot on the mat with my guard, and eventually guys would just get through. They'd smash through and pass. It wasn't until I learned how to be more mobile and to create that space and slip away, like you said, and have them constantly kind of following you in order to pass your guard. Uh, it, it really does help significantly. So. That's that's really cool that that's something you subscribe to. Are, are there any other uh, like 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 uh, tactics or strategies that you feel are really important along those lines uh, for smaller people dealing with bigger people? And I do. I and the one thing like few concepts I have like I tell my guys like if you develop uh, work on your battle game, few rules you have to be follow. First rules: your feet is gotta work as your hands. That means you have four hands on jujitsu. You know, your feet is not just hanging there. Your foot is to grab him. Your foot has to be somehow hooking his leg, hooking his arm. It has to be live all the time. And the second of all, your feet has to be in touch. You gotta th think he's a wall. Your foot has to be touching their wall all the time. Every time you let their foot, he's disconnect your foot from the wall. 
you don't do God anymore. So you know, I'm saying, thinking about the guys he, I let him put my feet on the air, I let him drive my foot to the side, I let him drive my foot down. No connection there anymore, you know. And uh, you're gonna you're gonna see some position you can apply from that or that situation happen. Yes, but the best position is stay in touch all the time. You know what I'm saying? That's the true advice I give to everyone who want to develop a good God game. You know. That's outstanding. Yeah, I really like that a lot. And it's, it's cool when you see someone that uses guard at a high level. You're right. There's always something in their hands and, there's, and their feet are always working as, as, as the limbs that they're intended yeah. to be. Yeah, so I really I really like that a lot. That's very, very good advice. Um, Hobson, I'll tell you what, man, switching gears here. I want to, uh, to do something with you here. This is something I do on every show when we get to the halfway point. It's a game I play with my guest. Uh, this is a game called The Pummel. The Pummels is a series of random questions. Some of these are about jujitsu. Some of these have nothing to do with jujitsu. Uh, but if you'd like to play the pummel game, I'd love to play this with you. Let's try. All right, man. Question one. What's the worst job you've ever had in your life? Uh, like that, I never had any job like besides you did, you know? Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you've, you've been a lucky man. You've never had to suffer through a bad yeah. job. That's excellent. I love it. Um, you're, you're living your life correctly. That's very good. Yeah. How about this? What's a secret talent that you have uh, outside of jujitsu? Seek that I have, uh, wow, uh, wow, good, good question. <laughs> that, you know, that's a good question. Let me ask you another question. That's one thing I regret in my life, right? And uh, I did have this conversation with a friend of mine a uh, few weeks ago, and uh, I have created so many things now, what things I want to do. Uh, but like my, my, my big, just answer your question, I think my, my, I'm pretty good on my mind, on my investment. I really, I, I'm pretty sharp to, 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 to really like think, a lot of people, they look at me like, oh, he's a jiu-jitsu guy. And no, it's not only a jiu-jitsu guy. You know? My mind is, is, I'm pretty sharp on my mind. I want to talk about like investing, things like that. That thing I really love actually. Uh, but just to keep, just, quickly and uh, I have so many things I want to do like just, I just like I play guitar right nice nice I, have, like, I like it that that's all my book I want to learn how to play guitar I bought two guitars and I gotta learn how to play guitar that's you know amazing. and uh, you know things like that right that's amazing what, what I, I just yeah you just showed the guitar on the camera what kind of guitar is it what what, what, what brand did you get it's just like a, a view alone like traditional like you call view alone nice not like no i let no i let we want just like yeah like an acoustic normal. acoustic guitar yeah, yeah awesome yeah. really cool really cool. yeah that's something i that's something yeah. i i enjoy guitar a lot too. i'm not very good but i'm trying to do that as yeah. well i think yeah having like you said i'm having, like i'm like white belt <laughs> I'm right. I'm right there with you. I'm right there. It's, it's, that's yeah. the one thing that you and I are equal on when it comes to activities. Jiu-jitsu, yeah. you're way beyond me, but guitar, you and I were white belts together. That's good. <laughs> uh, what do you think is uh, something that you wish you were better at? Uh, actually, no, I, that, that kind of, you kind of already answered that. Let me pick another one here. What do you think is the worst injury that you've ever had uh, in jujitsu? I think it was my, my ribs. I think I got like a ribs, like I popped my ribs once back in the years. Uh, it was kind of annoying uh, because it's kind of I couldn't do much. Uh, I think that, that was the worst one. Yeah, was it in the in the front of your chest or was it towards the back? Yeah, right, right in front. The front right that's in front. the worst. Uh, I mean, they both they're both yeah. terrible. Either way, either one is terrible. But yeah, in the front yeah. particularly is bad because every time someone passes your yeah. guard and gets to side control, it sucks so much more. <laughs> if you have a if you have a yeah. rib injury in the front, what do you think is uh, your favorite bad food to eat? Uh, favorite bad food. Uh, uh, I would say uh, I don't know how to say English, but in Portuguese you say giló. Ah, oh, giló. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah, yeah, jello. Yeah, jello. Yeah. Yeah, I hate that thing. Oh, you, oh, you don't like it at all. Cu cu uh, cucumber. Too. I hate cucumber. Cucumber. <laughs> So these are the foods. These are, these are the foods you can't, you don't like to eat. You don't like Jello. I, I don't like. And you don't like. Uh, yeah, and you don't, and you don't like cucumber. Okay. Okay. Uh, how, how about your favorite junk food? Like something that something that's not very healthy, but you, you that you like to have still. Uh, uh, I don't know if that like. I I'm not a junkie food guy, but I'll say pizza, maybe? Pizza. Pizza. Good choice. Yeah. Good choice. What's your yeah. favorite? Well, describe your perfect pizza. What's your favorite kind of pizza? 
Oh man, like I, I like I, that thing. Like I talk to my guys over here all the time. They say like, oh, pizza he's the best to do. You gotta go to Brazil oh, to bro. eat pizza. Yeah, yeah. You gotta go to good pizza. You know, and uh, you know I I like uh, I really like uh, from Catupiry. I like uh, the sweet one, like banana. Like I like banana pizza. Good choices, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The it's pizza, special. São Paulo, man, they have oh, the best pizza. I I have to work yeah. so hard to not get fat living down here, dude. I, yeah. it, it's hard. It's hard, man. Like it's funny. My uh, my my when I first came down here, uh, my wife was like, "Oh, you gotta try pizza here." And my my family's all from like the Chicago area, so we're like pizza sort yeah. of. We're kind of pizza snobs. So I'm like, "Oh well, you know, I know you guys are doing pizza too, but it's not like Chicago. Or it's not like it's not like the U.S." But we had some here, and I couldn't believe how good it is, man. And my favorite yeah. my favorite one down here is Portuguesa, and we which which to me was which for me was really different like as an american because it's got for the listeners portuguese pizza it's it's hard-boiled egg peas ham and onion so it sounds very strange it sounds yeah. very very different but man I, it's like my favorite thing it's like my vice down here with pizza so you like you like frango caite pari that's 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 your flavor yeah so for, for the like listeners that's that's sh- uh, shredded chicken with a cheese like a pr- it's kind of like a processed cheese uh that they put over the top that's a that's a good choice too yeah pizza's awesome in fact i'm getting hungry so let's move on what do you think <laughs> what do you think was the scariest moment of your life man the scariest moment of my life and uh and it was my big swing in my life as well uh was when i had my kids um I had my twins, and uh, my wife had uh, black clumps, and uh, she was in the ho- she was in the hospital for like I don't know three four weeks, you know. And, uh, and uh, my my kids they born they like premature they born with six months, right? Oh wow! And uh, I remember uh, one night like uh, my wife was connected to the computer like you know twenty four seven, and uh, so like it was around like two three in the morning like. This computer started beeping, and a bunch of doctors walking, like flipping my wife left and right, left and right, and nobody said nothing. And uh, then things calmed down, everything came normal. They found that my, my baby girl, my baby boy on the computer, everything was good, blah, blah, blah. So uh, everybody left. One doctor, she stayed in the room. When she left, I followed her. When I followed her, and I asked her, say, hey, why you guys don't do the C-section already? Because it's been so hard for me, for my wife. Yeah. Then we can finish that. And she looked to me straight face, looked inside my eyes and said to me, baby girls not going to survive. We'll try to give as much life as we can to the baby boy uh-huh. and walk away. Uh-huh. So, she, man, every time I see that, like, my, you know, I got to have buffs on me. So... She walked away. I remember that day, man. I was visualize myself, tie my key, tie my belt, shake the hand, and keep going for the next round. And uh, I walked back to the room. My wife, actually, she was there waiting for me to hear what I want to have to say to her. And I told her, everything looks great. Baby's fantastic. Let's keep moving on. Wow. And even though that moment, like I said before, my mind is so freaking sharp, I don't allow anything negative leave in my mind, right? And uh, I couldn't believe that would happen. If no way that gonna happen, you see my kids today, man. They had nothing. Five years old, they jumping, fly. They were such a beautiful. That's my biggest, you know, victory in my life. And there was a this scary moment I had in my life, you know? Wow. Hobson, man, I appreciate you sharing that. That's a really powerful story, man. I'm so happy that both your kids are fine. And man, what a, what a, what tremendous fortitude that that was on your part to, to have to put on a straight face and talk to your wife and tell her, Hey, everything's great. It was probably that energy. It was probably that energy and that, and that, um, you know, that, that, that mindset that helped, that helped her get through that. And look at, look what, look at the result, man. Your kids are both perfectly healthy now. It's amazing. Exactly. Exactly. And and they, I know I have some quotes I tell all the time. I say, I say to, to, to my students, I say to my, 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 my wife, I say to my, the people who surround me, you know, I say, guys, everybody has problems. 
but your problem is the size of the power you give to your problem. Yep. Guess what? All my problems is tiny because they don't give a shit for my problem. They don't give power for my problem. You know what I'm yep. saying? So that's how I live my life. So that moment, I always said, I knew the problem was huge, but I was no, I'm not going to give power for the problem. This is not going to happen. There's no freaking way this is going to happen. You know, and uh, so that, you know, again, I like, I, I shared that moment because it was a victory moment. But it was the most scary moment I had in my life. At the same time, as much I was so scary inside, I couldn't show. Yeah. Because I had my wife in there. Think about if I showed that to my wife, I could lose my wife, my kids. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's the moment when you realize you had no idea how strong you are when you have to face things like that. You know? Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, no, I, I can totally relate. Like now that I'm a dad, like it's, it's yeah, it really, there's a different level of, of stress and worry that can come with that. Like whenever I would yeah. have problems with myself, I'd you know, when I was single, I'd worried about myself. Now, when something happens with the kids, it's just like, it's like, man, it, it, you know, I don't care anything about yeah. myself at the moment. It's, it's all about them. And it's, it's, it's hard because yeah. you feel, little, not, you feel powerless because it's not, you're not dealing with you, you're dealing with them, you know? So it's kind of, yeah. it's crazy, but I appreciate you sharing that option. That was a really, really power, powerful, powerful. Like, I like this game. Let's keep going. Yeah, let's keep going, man. Let's do it. So who's your all time favorite grappler? Um, well, it, it, well, if I go back to my time, uh, I have so many guys I could give you like five names easily. Uh, but I think the guy, uh, wow, well, <laughs> it's a good question, man. Like, uh, uh, a lot of options, right? <laughs> yeah, but I, I know I, I, I think Shaolin was my favorite grappler. Not as, as a competitor because it's a training part. I see his uh, how hard this guy work and uh, and uh, I never see nobody work as hard as this guy on the mat. It was incredible, you know. And uh, I think Shaolin will be. Yeah, it's my, my pick. That's a fantastic choice, man. Yeah, Vitor Shaolin, incredible, incredible practitioner. Yeah. Um, who do you think is your favorite MMA fighter of all time? Uh, man, I, I see Minotauro. Minotauro, good choice. Good Minotauro, choice. It was a like cleaning jujitsu represent, you know. Damian Maia, again, go so, so many guys there. Yeah. Uh, who do you think is, uh, what, what is, what do you think was your favorite match that you had in your career? My favorite one, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think the fifth, my, my favorite match was the one I lost uh, uh, when I lost to Ricardo Vieira or the World Championship mm. uh, in nine, nine, 2000, maybe, uh, on the semifinal. Yeah. Uh, there was my favorite one. Not big, the, the, the fight was amazing. The skills we put on that fight was incredible, right? But well, I think it was an amazing one because that was, was a wake-up call for me. Because until that moment, I was not looking for 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 this young kid who was kind of to follow, you know. So the new generation was coming behind me. I was just looking like, okay, who is ahead of me? Like, but I couldn't see nobody ahead of me on my division. You know what I'm saying? And then uh, and then when the Ricardinho came to the division, and, if, and I was I said I I was calling him as a Leo Vieira's brother. So oh, that's Leo Vieira's brother. You know what I'm saying? That I think that that was a wake up call. Say, hey, you gotta pay attention to these kids because they they you expire there to be here, and they wanna you. They wanna like be like you, and they know for them to be like you, they have to pass to you. And that was like wow. And I think that was my, my yeah, that was my 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 favorite match for sure. That's a man, excellent. That's one of, that's one of my favorite matches. I remember that very vividly. Yeah. In fact, he he beat you just by a few points, right? It was it was just a it was, uh, was it a yeah. few, it, 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 it ended it was in two, points, right? Two or three points. Yeah, it was a very, very tight. I don't remember. I think it was two points or yeah. something like that. Was, I remember. I remember it being like, very close. But yeah, that was a great man. That's it's cool that you mentioned that one because that was a very very yeah. good fight. That was a very good fight. Um, what do you think is uh, your biggest phobia? Oh, uh, I don't have to be honest. I don't have one right now. Uh, 
I had one back in the years. I think my big one was always uh, kind of not make it, you know what I'm saying? What I've seen not make it is not make as a champion. Oh, I see. Not, not make it as a win in their life, you know? And uh, my whole point is that I have to win on their life. Because win on the, on, the, uh, eyes, uh, on, the, on the mat, it's one thing. Win in their life, it's something else, you know? And, uh, and I think that was always, always like my thing, you know, for many, many years. Because again, I, I came from a very bad neighborhood. I came from a very poor life. And, uh, and in my mind was also, you had to win on the life. No matter what you had to win on the life. And every time I was winning a competition, and I uh, was very nice, the feeling, you know, the pride, the proud, the, the, the celebration, everything, but I was not seeing, okay, wh what I had to do more to make you really win on the life. I think that was my, my big focus back there. Uh, but I, I, I actually, uh, I passed that because I was, it was, that was not helping me much, you know what I'm saying? And uh, when I visualize, I have to chill and let the things happen because you are the right direction. And, uh, and uh, I think that thing, when the things are happening natural for me, you know what I'm saying? That's incredible. Hobson, I'd love to, I'd love to pause the game here for a second and ask you something about that. You mentioned that you came from very humble backgrounds, that you, you came from a poor, a poor background. Obviously jujitsu, the opportunity to make a lot of money in jujitsu is something that's still relatively new in, in our sport. It's there's not, there, there wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of opportunities in competition in jujitsu back in the two thousands and the nineties, uh, when you were starting training for, for financial success, did you, did you recognize back then that jujitsu was a way out for you? E even though there wasn't a lot of money opportunities, did you still recognize it as, as a, as a path out? Like what, what, what vision did you see, uh, at that time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like uh, that, 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 that was my way out from that place. That was the way out to kind of like, because for many, many years, I was like, my goal was, okay, I had to change the history of my family because when they look back to the history of my family, everybody grew up in the same area. Everybody extend their house, connect the other uh, family member is always the same thing, always the same thing. Nobody was able to break their, their wall and just like, fuck it, let's do it. Let's make something new, you know? And uh, and there was my man, he go for the bay, I had to sh do it and show to my, my families and my, my cousins, all the, these young kids going to come behind me, everybody can do it, right? And uh, and I did it, and, uh, but I had the jujitsu was my my the thing I hold on jujitsu so tight to pull me from that that situation, and then uh, when I started looking all the things I I didn't have access when I was where I was living, and I said hey I can use the the jujitsu to go to different direction of my life you know, and uh, I think that was that was my my definitely my thing you know. Mm -hmm. The, the time I put on the sport, the love I put on the sport, all the people who helped me to go to, that was not by myself. I had the right people behind me, you know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, I think that was all, that, that was the key to moving me to the next, you know, to the next level, you know? That's incredible, man. You know, what you said there is really interesting because I know a lot of people that, that get stuck in, in poverty uh, around the world. One of the, one of the issues that they run into is just that they're, they're in a situation where the people around them um, don't know the answers. They don't have the solutions to get out. Sometimes they're just, they're just kind of stuck, like, like you described. But you, you mentioned that you recognized that you wanted to, to get out and get higher and move higher. Was it, was it, through, your, uh, was it through your involvement in jiu-jitsu that you started meeting people that were inspiring you to, to do better? Or was it something that you internally already had, but jiu-jitsu just helped you, get, helped you with the rest of the way? I, I, I think I had that. I think it's something I already had, but I didn't know. And I think, that, like you said, the jiu-jitsu is helping me to describe that, to put that out, you know, because uh, my out, my wife talked to me a, a lot about that because like I mentioned to do today to you, like, I love to, uh, I'm a big investor, I love, I love investment, I love to do things, I love to like really, I love, that's my, my passion, you know, awesome. and, uh, and uh, 
My parents has nothing to do on that. My parents has nothing to do. Sometimes I talk to my mom, something my mom she has no clue what I'm talking about. My dad he's like he's no idea what I'm talking about, right? And uh I think like I already had that on me and uh and did, like I said, Jiu Jitsu was the one like, hey, let's break that, let's move on, you know. And uh, and some people ask me today, like, hey, uh, if it wasn't for jiu-jitsu, what are you gonna do? I say, like, man, I'll be successful no matter what, if it wasn't for jiu-jitsu. I just need the right, you know, spot to be. That's all I need. And uh, again, now I know, but back then I did, you know. I'm pretty sure a lot of kids, and uh, they they cannot get off the, the, the situation they are because they, ha they have the feeling they want to, but they don't know how or they, they feel too far away from there, or so many things you can, like, you know, put it in the front of you to not go through, you know? And, uh, but it, it just, if you, if you uh, put it on your mind and believe, and uh, this, things gonna happen. Absolutely. That's incredible, sure. man. There's, there's a book I was reading where they were talking about generational wealth and things like that. And they were talking about how a lot of times with a family, if you take an entire family's history from like, you know, the, the, you know, from a hundred years ago, if you can track back that far, they found that a lot of times it takes one link in the chain, which is just one person to be able to break that link and, and change and, and, and either, you know, get an education or, or learn about investing or learn how to manage money or uh, get lucky. Sometimes people just get lucky. They get an opportunity that, that, that the rest of their family members didn't have and how that can then change the trajectory of the entire family tree moving forward like so that's it's, it's always really inspirational to hear people like that it's really cool that you're that you're that link for your family that's super cool yeah you know and it, like yeah like uh, uh just like going to back back from my time like i remember i had like a, a friend of mine who lived like a house like uh my, my neighbor he was living one house up me whatever <laughs> Same time I started with jiu-jitsu, I was trying to drag all the kids, like, you know, to go to jiu-jitsu, all my friends from the area, you know, and, uh, but again, nobody could afford that, like, you know, even though my mom, she couldn't pay, but she found, she figured out how to pay for me to train back then, you know, and, um, and then my, this, my friend, like, uh, uh, he started doing capoeira. He started doing capoeira over there, and then at the same time I was going for jiu-jitsu, he's going for capoeira. At the same time I was going for jiu-jitsu, he's going for capoeira. Today he's a capoeira uh, instructor, he lives in Paris, he run his school in Paris, you know, and uh, yeah, I think somehow I was inspired some kids on my neighbor because they were seeing me to not go into the wrong path because it was so easy, and they, some kids just kind of, okay, let me see what Hobbes is doing because I kind of want to go to that direction, you know, and uh, I think that was pretty, pretty nice. And I have so many things more I want to do be, to that direction to try to help some some people to go to find that way. When talking about like again, like it's nothing to do, uh, on like you be rich or not be rich. It's about you feel like hey, I accomplished my, my dream and I accomplished my 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 dreamy house. I accomplished my my dreamy car, I accomplish my, the, the, my job, I accomplish my, the, the, the thing I wanna, you know, I always dream, you know? And sometimes like uh, uh, you have to sacrifice so many things to make that, like I did. People see me now, say like, oh, how can live the dream? But man, I sacrifice so much. I live inside the school, like Monday through Friday, I was sleeping in the mat, you know? and. Uh, when I look back, I say, man, that was not easy, man, to be here, you know? And, uh, but yeah, like if you do sacrifice, if you put that on the line, it's no way it's gonna happen, you know? That's excellent. I love that, man. Well, I also, I also love that you, that you, that you're, uh, that you want to give back too. that you, that that's the direction you want to start moving yeah. in your life to give back. I've, I've personally got to see, uh, here in Brazil, there's, there's social projects uh, all over Brazil that offer jujitsu for free to kids that are in poverty. And one of my good friends down here has a, had a great one. Unfortunately, after COVID, they had to close it, but I got to see firsthand, like just what an impact that can have. And like, you know, he's got, he had this small social project here in Sao Paulo. I actually made a documentary about it. It's called uh, the Saint 
Hint of Crackland. It's free on YouTube for anyone that wants to check it out. But Lyle basically had these groups of kids, and some of them for the first time in their any out of anyone in their family tree, they went to college, they joined the military, they got uh, good jobs, and completely you know, made a pivot in, 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 in what the trajectory of their life would have been. So, Hobbs, and I think people like yourself uh, who have accomplished so much in the sport, giving back like that is, is really significant, man. So I, I commend you on that very much. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, now, switching back to the pummel game, uh, who's your soccer team in Brazil? Vasco. Vasco. Vasco da okay. Gama. Nice, nice. Now, you, the, you, you, the best one. You grew, up, you grew up in Rio, right? Yeah, I grew up like Teresópolis, like it's uh, outside okay. Rio, like hour and a half from Rio. Cool. Okay, right on, right on. Cool, cool. Yeah. So Vasco's, yeah, Vasco has definitely a big presence in in the entire state of Rio de Janeiro. That's yeah. uh, what, what do you think is um your favorite kind of music to listen to? Who's who's your favorite? Who's some of your favorite musical artists? Uh, it's funny, man. Because like, it's, we had this thing on the school this week because I always put in music on the train, I like the music on the train, but I'm not a music guy, I, I'm not the guy like, if I'm driving my car, I, I'm not the guy who's listening to music, I'm pr probably gonna be catch me listening some like, podcast, something like that, but I'm very chill on music, you know, like, I, I, I'm not like, anything too heavy, too bad words, not my kind of music, I, I like, Honestly, like the music I like to, to listen to my car is a jazz music. I like ah, cool. jazz. I like like chill music. Like music makes me like relax, making me feel like nice vibe, you know? And I don't like too much like bad or like heavy music is not my thing, you know? I hear you. No, that's awesome, man. That's great. I, I like, yeah, I like jazz and calming stuff too. You probably won't like, jazz. you probably won't like my normal playlist. I like, a, I like a lot of heavy stuff, but, <laughs> but that's cool. Yeah. Though. I like <laughs> it's funny. I saw, I saw like, uh, I saw like, uh, uh, Draculino. Draculino yes. posted a video this week about something like, he always thinks of like pretty heavy, like heavy yeah. metal music. And I was, holy smoke, man, that's not my thing at oh, all. Yeah, but like, it's, it's, it's cool, you know, but like, it's not, not my thing. Yeah, Dracolino's big into punk. I've had, I've had conversations with Dracolino about yeah, punk and stuff. Yeah. He, he actually performed live uh, with Cro-Mags, which is a, a big band from New York, the New York hardcore scene. That's awesome. Harley Flanagan is the, uh, the, the, the head of the band. He, uh, he's a, a black belt under Henzo. And yeah, he let Dracolino nice. take the mic and, and perform a whole song with him on stage. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. But, but, yeah, yeah, but while that was going on hobson was in his car listening to jazz he's keeping himself calm keeping himself cool i i, I like that yeah. i like that what do you think is your uh your, your uh the f what was the first car you ever owned the first car oh man was uh actually uh i had a super fight back in 1996 uh, as a purple as a brown belt i fought parrupinha on the does a few magic cannibal and uh, i won a couple a good amount of cash on that day for the sponsor for the fight paycheck whatever i saved their money to buy a car so my brother was younger than me he was already working and my brother bought a very old 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 car called brasilia i don't know if you know if you no, google, never, if you google heard of it. Yeah. The, yeah called brasilia the, the, when you have a chance to google that that's uh, it's, <laughs> so there I didn't even know how to drive, nothing like that. And my brother came home from his uh, his for lunch time, and I told him, "Hey, let me drive your car." He said, "Look, you don't know how to drive." I said, yeah, I know. Come on, I don't know how to drive, <laughs> right? So anyway, the car was a piece of junk, man. Like, and I started driving his car. They had this car parked on the side called like a Fiat Uno. So I hit that Fiat Uno from the back. Oh, the no. Fiat Uno was stopped right there. So the owner came like, what are you doing? You crazy, my car. Oh. That's on the favela. That was on the, on the favela, right? So like, today, don't worry, I buy your car. He said, what? He said, yeah, and I, I just buy your car. Because I was looking for my car. And said, OK, I want that much money. It's OK, I, pay, I bought a car. And now I had to fix the car because, like, <laughs> because I put in my mind, like, man, I believe if I fix his car, I'm not going to be able to buy a car. So let's like, better buy his car. <laughs> That's and amazing. Then, oh, my God. Fix all this. <laughs> that That's was so my good. first car. 
That's yeah. such a good story, man. I've never I've never heard someone buying a car that way, Hobson. That's super <laughs> unique. That's very yeah. unique, man. I like that. Yeah. That is That's awesome. Crazy. Yeah, I think I appreciate what you were saying about your brother's first car, about the Brasilia. Um, I, I think that's important, man. Like, like for Pete, for everyone should have their first car be kind of a junk car because because it makes you appreciate yeah. things as you get better in life as you as you as you get the next model and you upgrade over the years it makes you appreciate how things could be i think that yeah having having oh, a, yeah. having a, a a starter car is important man for sure yeah um well, who's your favorite superhero oh man uh <laughs> i don't have like uh uh uh, I'll say like a hook. Hook you was the one I was watching more. Hook's a good one. You know when I was kids. Uh, yeah, I'll say hook. You know. Hulk is good. Good choice. If you could have a superpower, what would you choose? Man, if I could have a superpower, bro, right now, I would definitely do something positive for the people. Otherwise, uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but it would be like something would be changing people otherwise to live somehow better. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, I would definitely do something on that direction. I don't know exactly what, but yeah. That's good. I like that. I like that. And then final question for the pummel game. Um, if a zombie apocalypse happens right now, what's the first thing you do? <laughs> uh, I'm not a zombie guy. No, I don't be, I got, I got, not believe all that kind of stuff, but like I'll, I'll grab my kids, man, like running from, as far I can to like the fourth place I can to nobody see my... <laughs> See me hide my kids, just something like that. <laughs> so you're bailing. You're getting out of there. You're bailing. You're not. You're not gonna. You're not gonna yeah. stay and fight the zombies. You're leaving. Oh fuck yeah! Yeah, yeah. I don't blame you. I don't blame I'll, you. I'll, I'll be, I'm out of that game. Say I'm out, guys. <laughs> yeah. I think. I think. I think that. Yeah, it's always. It always goes the the people in the movies that stay. They usually don't make it. You got to get out and get away from everything. So that's a good. Out, it's yeah. a good strategy. Protect my protect my kids for sure that's right man excellent well hobson that was the final question for the pummel game congratulations you win you got your double underhooks <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so man so so moving back to the topic of the day we were talking about uh using the science of jujitsu and harnessing the the the, the science of jujitsu as a super featherweight we were, we were talking last about uh top side pressure we were talking about how um you know, it wasn't until about uh, 2007 that you started really uh, focusing a lot of your time and effort on passing guard and playing from top. As a super featherweight, what are the most important ways that you use pressure from the top to keep larger opponents controlled from a position like side control or north-south or neon belly? Good question. And I tell my guys all the time about that. It's no matter how much you weigh, you have to feel like two times more than you actually are, two, three times, whatever. So, and the people say, like, oh, I'm gonna hold this guy here, gonna put a lot of pressure here. No, 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 it's not that. It's, you gotta find the balance. You gotta find the balance. That, it's hard to explain, but just something. I have one thing I do uh, from the, 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 when somebody lock me with the half guard, so if you have, if you lock me my on oh, my me on oh, my left left leg on the half guard right, so I I kind of put in my my right tiptoes on the floor and then me sit on my heels, and then my hips not on the floor my hips on my heel and then my tiptoes is glue on the floor. So why I do that? If you can just follow me on the imagination. Yeah. So if I drop my hips from the from the half guard. I have to disconnect my upper body from him, mm. right? Yeah. So when they glue my tiptoes and it's like drop my hips on my heel, I don't disconnect my upper body. Uh. It just, it's something very small I do. It, believe it or not, when you do it, you feel heavy. You feel pressure. You feel like, whoa, what he's doing? What, what you know? That kind of that, that sometimes that small things can be make a big change on your game, you know. 
Absolutely. No, I, I love that kind of stuff. And I, I, in fact, I love the I love the fact that you mentioned it's the importance of making yourself feel a lot heavier than you are, because we've all trained with someone that feels when they when they pass the guard or when they get to a good pressure position, they feel a lot heavier than they should. And it's always really fascinating to me when I see that. So 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 for you, it's about finding the right places to put your weight. It's finding the right places to let your opponent carry your weight um, for, for let's say for side control. If someone if let's say a smaller guy gets a bigger guy to side control, uh, what 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 pieces of advice do you, you know, as far as how you align your weight and how you align your body with theirs, what are the key points you're looking for? Hey, yeah, like, what to work for me, always the, the, when I get someone on the side control, they have the, the, the me, the big guy or whatever, mm. I never put in my weight on him. Because when I put in my weight on him, anything he can flip, I can feel, uh. right? I, I always slide my, my upper body weight through my hips and in my legs. So that means when he's moving, he's not moving me. So that means uh, when he's moving, I can feel where he's gonna go and it kind of lock it down the position. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I think what a lot of people mistake is, like I said, they go for the side control and they, because they're so commune to the hold position, they kind of, uh, and anything the big guy get, they flip, you go, you know? That's excellent. So, so you never you never commit your weight to where your opponent can manipulate it. That makes perfect yeah. sense. And you know, yeah. as, as as I think about your game, as I think about matches that you've had that I've studied over the years, I can see where that ties where that that concept ties in pretty well with your style because you're you're always um a, it just seems like you're always a step ahead of your opponent like any anything he does any way he moves you're usually transitioning you don't fight a lot to pin people to a specific position it's more you let them go where they want to go but then you're going to go to the next transition yeah. to be in the in a to continue in a dominant uh dominant control so that is really cool nice. do, do you think do you think that's something is that something that you try to um implement in all your students regardless of what size they I are I try, oh, yeah. de definitely try, I try. I tell my guys here all the time, for the guys, it's just like, I don't expect you move the way I am, I expect you move better than I am. You know what I'm saying? I want you to move better, I want you to move better, but your own way, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it's it just like, it's not easy. Uh, and the thing on Jiu-Jitsu, like, that's why like, it, like when they talk about Jiu-Jitsu, just beyond martial arts, because Jiu-Jitsu has something challenging us every day. Right, and then uh, and we feel like you know, ten years pass by, twenty years pass by, thirty years pass by, and then why we should doing that? Because we can't figure out that easy. So that means like you're gonna keep dig, keep dig, keep driving, and try to get in battle. And uh, and I tell my guys, look, just put yourself on that position, like you know, really like uh, I'm big. Uh, I'm mean, very big to, to challenge my guys to go to uncomfortable zone on jiu-jitsu so they can pass through there and they build their comfort zone from there, you know? That's excellent. That's excellent. I really like that. Well, you know, Hobson, uh, speaking of, of, of being in bad positions and using um, using uh, your energy efficiently to, to, to do well from, from, from wherever you're at, you have an incredible instructional with us here at BJJ Fanatics all about escaping bad positions, using a concept that requires little effort. And I, I wanted to, to make sure we talked about it today because uh, it really is a, it was a pretty mind-blowing concept when I was watching you demonstrate it and when I watched the instructional. It's called it's called the X-Escape. Uh, tell us about the X-Escape. What is it and where can it be applied? Well, the escape is very like you know my rules is if you can move your head like that you can escape, mm. right? So that mean like when you allow the guy pin you down, show the pressure on your jaw. Now you cannot move the head, you cannot move the body. The body, the head, they're connected. Yeah. So there's no way you're gonna look for your left side and you walk for right side. You know whatever you whatever side your head's point, that's where you're gonna go, right? So um, on the escape, I, I say like, when the guy go put pressure to go to the half guard, the side control, whatever position you are, and you kind of frame their arm, more pressure is put you on, use that moment to escape. So I use the X, then you can dive underneath his arm, control the head, so I go for the butterfly, then you start like go for other direction. But like, I, the whole uh, uh, point is, be able to do this move. Be able to slide your head back and forth. If you if you can move your head, you always gonna have a chance to escape. That's my whole point, you know. 
That's excellent. I, yeah, I really like the concept that, that you showed. Uh, in, fact, in fact, for anyone out there that wants to get some, kind of a preview of this concept, go to Hobson's uh, Instagram because he show, he did a great breakdown with Bernardo uh, in a video where he showed a few different ways that it can be applied from a few different places. But it's, it's literally an X with the hands. It's, it's using your arms in an X fashion, which is where the, where the escape gets its name. Yeah. It's very, very and interesting. The, yeah. And the reason, remember, I've always visualized a guy and think about if the guy he's like two or three hundred pounds, whatever, he's tried to get in the head on the on the on my half guard, my side of the If you do hold his gi like that, he's gonna be too clear. Yes. You know? So when you X, he's not gonna be able to go. More pressure is put over here, it's better for me because the X gonna say go, but when you see you out. You know, and uh, uh, that's why I kind of call X Escape. Uh, it's a very good uh, that DVD can be really nice. I think it's a lot of nice information on that on their on their DVD, and uh, uh, it's definitely it's the situation you always gonna be. You know, and uh, if you can plant that, you can you can bring that X game X Escape to your game. It's gonna help you. Just, big time that's excellent yeah like i said i I've, i was really blown away by all the options that it leads to as well there's a lot of great transitions and attacks and reversals based off of that escape and i also really appreciated how how effortless it looked when you were doing it to bernardo because obviously there's a very big weight difference between the two of you and it looked you made it look so easy like to, to elevate him up and to get him in in a bad position as a response to a uh, cross face was a really impressive thing so it, it led me to go get the instructional i've I've really been enjoying it. You did a very, very good job on this instructional. Nice. Um, yeah, nice. and I, I really do recommend everyone check it out. Again, it's called uh, X. It's called X Escape, and it's available right now at BGGFanatics.com. So definitely go check it out. Um, Hobson, in closing, man, what are some of your major goals for 2023? What are some things that you hope to accomplish this year? Uh, I probably like I did a super fight last a few months ago. No, last year I did a super fight last year. Uh, September last year at Polaris, mm. uh, was really good. I had a fun time. Uh, I probably want to do another super fight for uh, 2023. Nice. Um, uh, that's like you know for my for my personal you know thing you know get a super fight. Uh, I always train. I always keep myself training because I love to train. I love to keep myself like uh, physically good. Uh, you know mentally. Uh, so you know, I'm more probably I'm gonna pull another super fight. Uh, that's one of my goals. Uh, you know, and my probably that direction for sure. That's excellent, man. I love that. Well, it's it's funny when you mention that you always keep yourself sharp. I meant to ask you. There's a video uh, from from a long time ago now, but uh, of of a big guy that came into your gym to challenge you, and uh, and you were ready to go. And it's a great video. I recommend you guys check it out on YouTube. Have you had any other any other drop in challenges since then, Hobson, or did that pretty much resolve? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and uh, that that guy was kind of something else, man. He tried to sue me afterward, you know. No, and, uh, did he really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? And the thing is that guy, uh, I found out that guy was kind of going to this a lot, a lot of karate school and doing that kind of stuff. You know, sometimes you go to not do respect at all. I think, uh, you know, but a lot of karate, they kind of like, they, they I don't know, they didn't take the decision. I think like, what do you... You don't walk in jiu-jitsu school and do things like that. Now, you can get away walk like maybe a karate school, maybe. Uh, I think he got away a couple of times doing that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they came to the school and uh, I think it was, uh, you know, it was not the right place for him to do that. No. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah, usually usually a jiu-jitsu school, an MMA gym, or a boxing club are the three places where if you're looking for trouble, they'll they'll definitely yeah. serve they'll serve you something. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and the one the one thing on jiu-jitsu, like when when the I, when the, the the thing like remember he, he was not there challenging me as a man. Yes. He was there telling me jiu-jitsu is not work against him. Yes. So I'm. When he does that, like my, because I had a couple of friends tell me about it. Why did he like broke his nose like that? Like, because that was not the point. If I could go there with the time I got a heel on the ground, I could like throw the elbow in his face, break his job. But that's, I'm not proving he did jujitsu work, right? Yeah. So, and his whole point was jujitsu cannot work against me because I'm too big, I'm too strong. There's no way jujitsu can work against me. Okay. So it's my job to show him, no, 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 listen, man. 
I'm gonna show you judiciary can work against you and against anybody. So, you know, because I see, uh, I, I remember like, uh, uh, I have seen videos of people walk some jujitsu school and the jujitsu instructors go then beat the crap off the guy broke the nose yeah. really but you not prove the point you know what i'm saying if someone again like it's something you're on the street somebody come to you hey i'm gonna beat you up blah 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 now his child he was a man that's some, something else right yeah so but when he's walk in at your house and tell you whatever you've been doing for 30 plus years of your life not work you have to show this guy that thing is does work you know what i'm saying yeah. and uh that, that was my my whole point that's why i did it because i had friends ask me like man you're too good you shouldn't break his nose and no 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 you know i don't think you understood the message you know what i'm saying uh, yeah. and uh so I think you handled it perfectly. And, and I also, I, when I was watching that video, I remember thinking, you know, it's so good that this guy came in specifically to Hobson's school because there's not really any way for him to justify anything. If someone, if, you know, if, if there's obviously a huge weight difference and size difference between you two. And it's hard to, for him to leave that day justifying it in himself mentally. He'd have to be doing some real mental gymnastics to convince himself that he that you got lucky or anything like that. When someone much smaller than you hands you your ass in every way, shape, and form, it, you have to walk away saying, okay, yeah, you know what, dude, that stuff works. Like, man, yeah. dude, that's that's the real deal. Like, jiu is the real deal. So, yeah, you're right. You didn't have that's to do right. anything further than that. So that was awesome. Yeah. But I'm glad I'm glad that people in, in Tampa have gotten the message, man. Don't go into Hobbs and start in trouble because he'll he'll tie, he'll tie you up man that's awesome no, don't, don't go again I'm, I'm so respectful like I, you know i'm a big martial arts respectful you know like every martial arts in my view has a philosophy behind every martial arts has a has a belief right that's why people do martial arts so and i, I would, like like or dislike i agree or disagree i'm not gonna walk to a martial arts karate guy tell he hey, your martial arts don't work. I would never do that. Right. So it's it's different if he, it's a challenge between a martial arts like against martial arts like you know Horace Grace did back in the years, and he made the proof Jiu Jitsu was, you know, prove there was a better martial arts than other martial arts. So not not like today you go to UFC today, who is a better athlete? Who is a better, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Who is a better athlete is going to become a better fighter. So back in there, like, you know, when you're talking about, like, you know, martial arts and against martial arts, it's a different kind of, like, you know, approach, you know what I'm saying? And uh, that's it. Like, when you come to me, tell me, like, jiu-jitsu not work, I will die to prove you it does work, you know what I'm saying? So that's my whole point because it's, that's what I've been doing for 34 years of my life. There's no way... There's no way somebody can tell me that's BS is not working. No, no, it's not. We're gonna we're gonna go crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I think I think it's awesome that, that that you're out that people like you are out there to 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 show people the light if they don't if they doubt it you know and I think a lot of times that the people that left the people that are left that still doubt jujitsu I think just don't haven't done their research I mean it clearly it obviously works very well so I'm really but I'm really happy to hear that you know so far there haven't been any other any other people coming into your school and starting trouble that's good that's good to know I'm also very excited to hear man that you that you want to do a super fight this year it's always great seeing you compete so I, I really look forward to that as well and you know, we'll definitely be cheering for you once you're out there again yeah so. yeah it awesome. could be sao paulo you know could be Man, paulo. I dude, do like uh, i do like uh fipa uh fipa's events that's i love that yeah that bjj stars yeah bjj stars and, is uh, i love bjj star send a message to fipa fipa you know how to reach out to me let's let's make this happen you know that's awesome man if you're down here you have to let you have to let me know man we have to i, I definitely yeah, love definitely. to see you while you're here let's have some pizza after all. man let's get a yeah. pizza on me <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. Hobson, it is always a pleasure talking with you, sir. I appreciate you being so uh, generous with your time and your knowledge. Uh, I loved hearing all, everything about, that we talked about today, about your background and about uh, development and your, and your concepts that you think are really important for people of all levels to use to be successful in jiu-jitsu. And you're welcome back on the show anytime. I'd love to have you back whenever you want to come on. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I uh, hope like we don't take that long to have the conversation again. It was a few years. 
uh, brief, you know, for the first conversation to now, you know, it's always good to talk to you, and it's always great to share uh, a little bit of my, my journey on the sport, you know, and, uh, and share, like, you know, uh, what I've been doing and uh, be ha be able to help the Jiu Jitsu community. I'm very happy and very glad. Thank you for your job. Of course. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. We will not wait seven years again. We'll do another one very soon. I promise. <laughs> so, for anyone out there that wants to keep up with Hobson, it's real easy to do so. Uh, he's active on all social media. He's uh, on Facebook. It's Hobson Mora Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Association. Uh, make sure you guys follow that page. Uh, Instagram, it's Robinho Mora. So, it's just Robin, R O B I N H O Mora. Uh, his last name so follow him on instagram he's got some great content he puts up so uh, i definitely encourage you to do that on youtube hobson mora bjj you guys like subscribe hit the little bell icon to get notified when he adds new content uh and then the website is hobsonmora.com that's a great way, place to keep up with all his seminars and news and everything he's got going on uh and of course guys if you ever uh, if you live in florida or if you're traveling through the, the tampa area he's got an outstanding academy there uh, you guys can drop in very welcoming uh environment Environment, really good group of people. So drop in, get some training if you're through Tampa. Uh, if you're not in Tampa, he's got affiliates all over the world. So make sure you guys are uh, looking it up if you're traveling around and looking for a place to train. Uh, check out his website. All his affiliates are listed there. If you can't get to a physical location where Hobson's, uh, where Hobson himself or his affiliate uh, or his affiliates are teaching, you can learn from him anywhere in the world here, here at BJJFanatics.com. Uh, we talked in depth today about his instructional called the X Escape. It's a really really great instructional that I really encourage you guys to check out. He's got a couple other ones as well. So check out bjjfanatics.com, type in Hobson Mora and absorb some of that knowledge. And that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. I really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the BJJ Fanatics podcast.